I'm only going to cover, um, in fact, I am sure that I'm only going to cover to verse, if I can find it here, verse 12 to verse 20. Um, and then I'll finish up the chapter next week. Uh, chapter 22 we're in, Job chapter 22. And remember from verse 6 to verse 11, um, this is where, and I've, I've pr- keep pronouncing his right, name wrong. I call him Eliaphaz. It's Eliphaz. Uh, you know, pardon me for not, it's, I added some of, an, an extra syllable in there to make it easy on me, but it's Eliphaz, not Eliaphaz. So, um, and I looked, I thought, no, no, no. And I looked it up. Sure enough, I had it wrong. Um, anyway, <clears throat> and I'll probably still call him Eliphaz because now I'm used to it. But Eliphaz, uh, in verse 6 to verse 11, uh, he just started making all these charges, uh, accusations against Job. And uh, he's accusing him of everything but white privilege here. I mean, he's, he's throwing the whole, uh, whole thing at him and seeing what will stick. And uh, I want you to keep, I just want you to remember verse 11 where it says, uh, the, the, the last part of that uh, uh, verse there, and abundance of waters cover thee. So just keep that in mind as we start reading on. And then in verse 12, life as goes on, he says, Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. And that's got an exclamation point. I, I, the mind cannot even imagine how high they are. And verse 13, and thou sayest, how doth God know? Can he judge through the... See now, and he's, t- he's putting words in Job's mouth again. And thou sayest, how, how doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. So Eliphaz, he's still at it, uh, still be slandering Job now, putting words in his mouth, insinuating that God can't see what Job's doing because... You know, God can't see through His own clouds and His own darkness. Um, and, maybe, and maybe Job has been kind of accusing God of really not seeing what's going on because why would this go on if you're seeing what's going on? But it's the insinuation that Job's not saying that God's not seeing it. He's just, Job's saying that I'm not understanding why God's seeing this and allowing this to happen. But verse 12, he says, Is not God in the height of heaven? Behold the height of the stars, how high they are. Uh, That's an understatement to the vastness of this universe. And the more science keeps looking up, the farther it get, the farther the ceiling goes. And, you know, I told you about the, the Hubble telescope where they have modified that thing to look out farther and farther and farther. I think something happened to it. It went offline. I don't know if they're going to get it back. But it's already served its purpose. We can't see the end because God won't let them. Uh, the nearest star outside of our sun is 25 trillion miles away. That's the nearest one outside of our sun is 93 million miles away. The nearest star beyond that is 25 trillion miles away. And I think it's, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's Draconis, something like that. But Prima, huh? Alpha Centauri, but he gave, uh, Dr. Rutman gave a name of another one. Yeah. What's the difference? Okay. <laughs> oh, just a, you know, couple hundred billion miles. No world, you know, just around the corner from the other one. Okay. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I, I thought it was Alpha Centauri too. And then when he gave that name, I'm like, it sounds like it's the same neighborhood. Well, it is, evidently. So it's 25 trillion miles away, and at the speed of light, it would take you four years and four months to get there at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Okay, but that's the closest one. <laughs> the farthest star in our galaxy at the speed of light would take 75,000 years to reach. And that's in our galaxy. That's not going outside of our galaxy. Man, here's the point of this. No one is going to be tapping on the sea of glass and saying, I'm here. I found you. No one. God is just not going to let it happen. 
Uh, Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. And man, when he says high and holy, he means high. And he also means holy. With him that is, that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to, re, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You see, the only ones you ever find out about God don't find out by searching for him. They find out by revelation. That's the only way you can find him out. Now, you can know he's there, but you don't know who he is. Revelation 4, 6 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes, before and behind. That's that sea of glass they're knocking on, or they're never going to be knocking on. They're never going to make it that far. Uh, he mentions in verse 13 and 14, dark cloud and thick clouds. I don't think he's talking about the ones above our heads in, in, in the first heaven where the birds fly. Now, I think in other places he, he might be talking about those clouds. But there's something, there's some clouds up, up there way up high. And there's some dark clouds. When I was looking at some of the images that came back from the Hubble telescope, I saw clouds out there. Not, not, not just galaxies, there was like clouds out there in space. You say, well, it's probably, doesn't matter what it is, it's a cloud. And they look thick and they look dark. And the Bible talks about God dwelling in the, in the pitch darkness. I mean, He dwells in eternity. I don't know what that means, but evidently, I mean, unless He puts light on the subject, it's pitch dark. In Psalm, 1, Psalm 18, 9 to 11, it says, He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under His feet. And He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, He did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness His secret pavilion, or His secret place. His, his pavilion round about Him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Well, I know there's water up there. Okay, dark waters, and there are thick clouds. And God is hiding behind that to where there will never, ever exist a telescope that can see Him. There is, science says they've detected light behind our universe. Something that's lighting the cosmos, not very much, but something that is relighting the cosmos. The Bible says, in God is light, and in Him is no darkness. The glory of God Himself is, is, is a light. In fact, it mentions over there the spectrum of that light. We talked about that. Like a, like a rainbow. The queers can't have it. They can never have it. That's part of God's glory. They try to steal it. They, they, can, have it. they can say they've got it for a while, but they can't keep it. God has given that entire spectrum of light. And the intensity of that light is enough to put a glow on this universe. And he is behind curtains of clouds and water. And his glory is still there. I don't know how else to explain that. Um, let's see. The, okay. Job 37, 23. Um, this is another verse where I've told you that some of the, some of the reasons why I reject um, uh, geocentricity or um, heliocentricity or flat earth or any of those things where it would look like God did it. He will not let man find him out that way. Okay? So science will just keep searching forever, if you let them, forever, never finding out the truth because the truth is right in front of them. And it's not blind faith. It has substance. And they just won't, they won't accept it. In Job 37, 23, it says, Touching the Almighty, we cannot find Him out. And that's the end of it, man. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. But the thing is, touching the Almighty, we cannot find Him out. Man can search and search and search, and they will never find him because he doesn't want to be found that way. He's too high and holy. Instead of just believing him. 
If a scientist really wanted to do something, go to this book and look at this book and say, man alive, look what's in this book. Look how much science is in this book. Look how much history is in this book. And it's infallible. Do you know how many times they've accused the Bible of bad history? Probably, well, no, they've been accused of it thousands of times. you know how many times it's stuck? It never has. Because every time they go and find it out, every time they go and dig in the dirt, guess what they find? The Bible's right all along. Oh, there's no Belshazzar. There's another, it was his father, it was King Adonidas, or whatever his name was, you know. And come to find out, you know, they didn't find anything with Belshazzar's name on it. One of the reasons was because when, uh, when the Persians came in, they wanted to remove his name from the earth. So they said, there is, there is no Belshazzar. It was this, this other guy, his father. Or at least they couldn't find where Belshazzar reigned. Not that he didn't exist. And then they found it. Sure enough, his father should have been reigning, but he, he preferred to dig in the dirt too. And, and do archaeology. So you know what he did? He kind of just abdicated his throne and let his son have it. Who? Belshazzar. The Bible's right all along. Do you know that Belshazzar offered Daniel what place in the kingdom? Third? Why not second? Because daddy was the king. He was on the throne and he was offering Daniel third place. Right again. Bible's never wrong. How can God be wrong with history? How can God be wrong with science when He invented it? Anyway, He won't let this world find Him out. Oh, you know, uh, they'll find Noah's Ark. Maybe. There's been so many sightings of the thing, I don't know why they haven't drug it down from the mountainside by now. But does it matter to you? It doesn't matter to me. I mean, it's just one more notch, you know, where God, God's right and the world's wrong. But whether they find it or not, it kind of doesn't really make any difference whether they do or not. I don't care whether they do. It doesn't make sense to me that it's up there. Because I would have dismantled the whole thing, took all the wood and built houses with it. I'm in on top of a mountain, man. They just had a flood that killed everything. I mean, if there was any wood, it's probably saplings and stuff that's, that began to grow, but all that other wood might have been waterlogged or killed or dead or what, you know. And plus, you're on top of a mountain when they landed. Where are you going to get your wood? Where are you going to get your wood for your sacrifices? Your wood to build your homes? You in an ark of wood. <laughs> that's where you're going to get your wood. The lumber yard you rode in on. <laughs> you know? That just makes sense to me, you know. Why are we looking for something you know they dismantled? Cages and all. Anyway. Um, now, God may be, he may have hidden himself. And he has. At least from man's prying eyes. Not from the book. He wants you to seek him out. But he's not going to let man's prying eyes, you know, these, this, these scientists ever discover him. Uh, but it says there that he knows exactly what's going on. In Proverbs 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Um, don't be worried about God not seeing. He sees it all. I mean, he sees it all. There's nothing that he doesn't see. Um, and then in verse 15, he says, Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? Uh, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? All right, and I probably didn't read that with a proper influx here. The, look what he says there, the old way. Hast thou marked the old way? And they're talking, he's talking to Job. Hast thou marked the old way, which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood? There it is. Remember I keep telling you that Job, the closest thing to Job, as far as history goes, is the flood. So they keep bringing it up. And they keep bringing up, or at least, you know, Job brings it up, they bring it up, and they're talking about these wicked men that God destroyed because of this flood. 
And they're asking Job, hey, did you mark the way? Did you mark that way? Now, look at verse 15. Thou, thou hast thou marked the old way, which wicked men have trodden. Um, I'm sorry, that's not verse I wanted. Verse 17. Look what they look what he says the wicked have said, which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Now what, the reason he's saying that is, if turn back to Genesis chapter 4, and let's read from verse 20 to 22, because these are the folks who are, these are pre-flood individuals. And notice what it says about them. It says, And Ada bare Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell, uh, dwell in tents, and, and such as have cattle. Well, there's your food. And his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all such that handle the harp and organ. There's your music. And Zilla, she also bare Tubalcain. Somebody has a real problem with names, man. Uh, she also bare Tubalcain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubalcain was Naama. So the reason is that they say they have no need of God is because they have everything they need. Huh? America, you know in America, has no, they have no need of God because they have everything they need right now. Okay? When people do well, and think about it, this is pre-flood. So, you know what they don't do? They don't age quickly. You know what they don't have? Microorganisms eating them up. Huh? They do not have all the things that's going to... They do not have their longevity falling to three score and ten. They're living hundreds of years. And they're doing well. They have plenty. He even says that he gave them things. He gave them, he gave them plenty of good things. And they're saying they don't need him. Job had a lot of stuff. He had cattle, sheep, things, houses. Hmm. What they're trying to say is that uh, you're saying, Job, the accusation is aimed at Job that you said you didn't need him. That's what you did. In um, 2114, they repeat it. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Um, they did not need God because of their wealth and health. Those pre-flood conditions provided a near utopia. If we had just what they had, even after the fall, if we just had pre-flood conditions on this earth, You'd live to be 900 years old. You wouldn't have any of, the, uh, any of these. Um, there's no disease that even shows up until after the flood, I think. Because when God changed this thing, I mean, you didn't even have rain. It was a sunny day every day. Now, you know what they said? They said, depart. Do you know what Job said? It's almost like Eliphaz is a prosecuting attorney weighing everything. that Job is saying things at the heat of the moment. You know, we do that. I mean, you know, when you're under extreme pain or stress, you're probably going to say something that, you know, that's the reason why if you ever get involved in something where there's a crime, a shooting, or this or that, don't talk to the cops for 24 hours. Just don't. Say, I want to see my lawyer. I want to sleep on it. I'm upset. Don't open your mouth. Because you'll incriminate yourself in something you're not, you haven't done. Could have been self-defense. He said, I decided I was going to blow that guy away. You know, and oh, they, oh you wanted to blow him away. I didn't mean it that way. I just want to shoot him, you know. You wanted to shoot him? No, no. I didn't. You see what I'm saying? You just keep talking. Next thing you know, they bury you under the jail. And all you did was defend yourself because your adrenaline is just, I mean, you're, I mean, you're high. You're high on adrenaline. Give it 24 hours. And you talk, do you know that they don't allow cops to talk after a shooting for like 48 hours or at least 24? Why? Because they're jacked up just like you'd be. Jacked up on insulin. So the, 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 they say the thing to do is just be quiet, huh? Well, insulin. 
adrenaline. The diabetics may have a little high from the insulin. No, I bring you insulin. Oh, good grief. I don't tell them what I'll say. Um, but Job does say something in the heat of the moment. Job 7, 19. He says, how long wilt thou not depart from me? Nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle. Now that's, that's not the same, but he's going to make it the same. You see, how he's, you see how he's drawing this up? He says, you said that. You told God to depart from you. But when Tubal-Cain and all of them told God to depart, they were doing well. They weren't suffering. Job is suffering at the hand of God in the extreme. He says, just leave me alone so I can swallow my own spit. That's all he's asking. Give me a little break here. Let up. That's all he wants. Let up. There's none of us that won't come to that in one time in our life. Just let up. And you mean it. God says, I'll let up when I want to let up. <laughs> but he said it. And maybe it was ill-advised to say it. There's a lot of things. I've open mouth, insert foot, I don't know how many times in my life. I'm a preacher. What do you expect? I say a lot of words. Insulin. Yeah. Um, but he's asking, he's acting like he's a prosecuting attorney and he's, uh, he is uh, watching every word that Job speaks and then using it against him later. Well, that's what people do. They'll, I mean, if you've ever thought about that, they'll They've got everything they want to pick your life apart. You've given it to them. Social media, you've given it to them. You've given them the ammunition to make you out as anything they want to make you out to be. Because they've got the information. They've got your words. They can twist them and turn them and pervert them. You think they don't do that? There's a hundred different versions in English on the market doing just that to God's words. Don't think they won't twist yours. Better watch what you say. It can be used against you in a court of law. Um, verse 18, Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. Now, <laughs> I, don't know why he, I know why he said it. You know why he said that? But the counsel of the wicked is far from me? Because Job said it. And he's mocking Job. Yet he filled their houses with good things, just like he filled your houses. Yet the counsel of the wicked is far from me. Job said it in 21.16. Lo, their good is not in their hand, and the counsel of the wicked is far from me. He says, your house is filled with goods, but the counsel of the wicked is, you know, the counsel of the wicked is far from me. It's, he's saying it mockingly. I mean, these guys are just downright vicious now. Every attack gets more vicious. I thought, well, we've seen the end of this thing. It should go, start going the other way. It's just more vicious every time they open their mouth. All right, verse 19. He said, the righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn. Uh-oh. Now it's reached new heights. Life has its buddies um, who think they are righteous and innocent are glad at what happened to Job, that's what he says, and are laughing because of it. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn. Who else could it be talking about but them? They certainly weren't talking about Job. They said, we're glad this happened to you. It finally came out. Matter of fact, it just makes me want to laugh. And these are his friends. I'd hate to see what kind of enemies he had. You think, can people be that cruel? Yes, they can. Do you know this, there's something about this. Well, first let me mention this. Um, these so-called righteous and innocent will also laugh a sinless man to scorn. In Matthew 9, 24, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. That was Jesus Christ. And he was right. She was just sleeping. He, he woke her up from death. He raised her from the dead. Now, um, 
If anything, God is the only one in a position to laugh at, at, at sinful man or at sinfulness. Proverbs 126 says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your fear cometh. Psalms 2, 4 says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. What we're told as Christians is to watch our step and to watch our mouth, even when we are talking about the wicked. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the, the pot calling the kettle black. I mean, yeah, we're not as low down as some, I mean, we're not the lowest scum of the earth, you know. There's some pretty low people out there. Yeah, but give it a chance. Give it an opportunity. Few things didn't go your way in life. Bad parents, bad church. Maybe you could, maybe you could have hit the heights of wickedness. So in Psalm or Proverbs 24, Proverbs 24, verse 16 to 19, it says, For a just man falleth seven times. Even good men, men that try to do right. And that's what I mean by good men. They're not sinless, but they want to do right. Uh, they fall seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. You hear that? Let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. In other words, if, you want to, if, if this individual deserves to get it in the neck that bad, back off, and God will finish him. You start laughing about it and having a good time about it, and he's going to... Because the Lord knows this, but by the grace of God, there go you. That's the thing you've got to worry about. If you think that you can't hit the levels of that kind of wickedness, you're wrong. You can. It's just the, 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 what God did for you and the environment he puts you in, there are very few men that could have withstood that kind of temptation. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know... I'm just saying that given the potential... There's, we, we do just about anything. We have the potential for it. Not saying you'll do it, but just be careful. He said there, lest the Lord see it and displease him and turn away his wrath from him. Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious of the wicked. That's or envious at the wicked. Well, that's kind of strange. I think that, I think that was the issue right here. They're happy and actually laughing him to scorn. Why? Why would you be that happy? I mean, somebody just, I mean, they've lost their children. They've lost their homes. They've lost their livelihood. He's lost everything. Why would you be so happy about that? Unless you were envious of that individual. And if Job is so wicked, is so wicked why are they envious of the wicked? But they're righteous and innocent, right? Oh. My question is, is what would God have done if Job hadn't prayed for him? Because Job's a better man than me. <laughs> if I had them three sitting around me, accusing me of everything and laughing at the death of my children, mm, I don't know, I, I thought, well, I don't know if I feel like praying for the next couple weeks. You know, you know what Jesus looked over at Peter and said these horrifying words. I mean, they're horrifying. Satan hath desired thee to sift thee as wheat. I'd have fell over. I'd have just fell over and want to die. I said, no, Lord. I mean, Satan hath desired thee to sift thee as wheat? I'm going to take you to task. Can you imagine... If Job wouldn't have prayed for those three friends, what would have happened to them? Probably the same thing, if not more, than what happened to Job. Job's definitely a better man. I mean, wouldn't you want to see just a little bit of it happen? I mean, you know, just some fire come down from heaven, burn up something they own or something. I know. Um, so he says there in uh, verse 20, and we're going to finish up with this verse. Um, he said, The righteous see it and are glad, the innocent laugh them to scorn, whereas our substance is not cut down. <laughs> I mean, you know, taking this stuff in context, you're just like, How in the world could this guy say this? 
He said, but the remnant of them, the fire consumeth. Now here's what he's saying. He's saying the proof that he's wicked, we're not. I still got my substance. Okay? So what he says about Job, he says the remnant of them, the fire. He's talking about the remnant of the wicked from the flood. Somehow, you know, that bad seed come across the, with the ark, which, you know, it, it was all bad seed, but some extremely bad seed came across with that ark, and that Job is this remnant of the wicked, and God's taking care of him by fire instead of water. Why? Hadn't touched our substance. And we, we've, one thing we, we've determined in the Job is looks are deceiving of what's really going on. And sometimes you're the one getting it, but you're not getting it because you're wicked. You're getting it because God's either trying to do something with you or do something uh, or prove something with you. In Job's case, it was both. He's trying to prove something with Job and then do something with Job because there was an issue. Okay. He mentioned there... Um, that the waters of God's judgment, in verse 11 says, the abundance of waters cover thee. Covers Job like the flood covered the wicked in Noah's day. And of course the evidence of this is the fact that God had not touched their stuff. So, he's saying the reason Job is underwater is the same reason those wicked were underwater. He's just under the water of God's judgment. They are under physical water drowned. He's likening him, saying, you are them. You are those wicked. Somehow you have come through, and God's dealing with you now. And all that self-righteous talk, and all that so-called, I love you, brother, want to help you. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're just wagging their finger. Same thing they did to Jesus Christ. You know, he said he hath a devil. That's what they said about him. They said he did his, his miracles by the prince of the devil, Beelzebub. So, and by the way, you can take verse 12 to verse 20, move it forward about 3,800 years, and it'll fit right now. And that is, um, it'll fit when we're getting up toward the advent. Why? The wicked, for the most part, have all the stuff while those made righteous by Jesus Christ struggle to make ends meet. I mean, if you think the saved of this world own most everything, you would be dead wrong. There's a few of them out there that are wealthy, but not very many. For the most part, you know, I'd say most of your Christians are in a middle class situation or, or even poor. Um, that seems to be the ones that, re, that react to the gospel the most. Because middle class is perfect because... You're not poor, so poor that you curse him, and you're not so rich that you forget him. In the middle class, you just know you need him. And that's, a lot, that's, that's the reason why the middle class is attacked in this country. It's where, it's, where the, uh, it's where the saved are, it's where the Christians are, evangelicals, whatever you want to call them, and that's the reason they're going after them. Um... But think about in the tribulation. The Jews in the, in the tribulation will be cast out as evil and hunted to near extermination. And they'll make a good, they'll make a good uh, um, accusation against them. I've never seen the like, man. I, when they want to go after somebody in this world, it's like, a, there, there, there was a, I've never seen this movie all the way through. I don't know how much of it I've seen. Not very much of it. I didn't care for it. But it's called uh, Wag the Dog. Yeah, have you ever seen that? Okay. But it's about what it is. It's about where politically they needed some war. And this station or film company actually produced this fake war that wasn't happening. But yet it was on the news every night. And of course everybody was taking their feed from this station, I don't know who they were, but they were taking their feed from them, so everything they produced, it was fake. It's called, you know, the tail wags the dog, was, it's called Wag the Dog, I think is the name of it. And 
This world has gotten really good at lying and fabricating things and just... And by the time you find out, of course, you know, it's way past the, uh, the time when you needed to know. And they, they go on that. They, they just found out, oh, we could just, we could just out and out lie. I mean, we could just out and out lie now. And nothing happens. Well, uh, you're on the brink of losing your country when that kind of thing starts going on. And here, life has just started out and out lying <laughs> about Job. Job's trying to defend himself, you know. But he's accused him of everything. Well, before we get out of here, that may be how it is with us. You get some accusations made against you. Uh, because you believe in the Second Amendment, you're some kind of terrorist. And you're especially bad because you're a white terrorist. You know, you and that white privilege and that uh, white nationalism and I mean, I never heard this stuff before. Well, like white nationalism, is that real? You know, started looking through, you know. I'm, I consider myself a nationalist. I never threw white in because I didn't think that mattered. I know black people that are nationalists. I know Orientals that are nationalists. Stand for the flag, stand for the nation. What's white got to do with it? I still ain't figured it out. All I know is that 60% of this country is white. And somehow they're trying to overthrow the majority. I mean, if you think, I'll just say it, if you think those minorities would have what they have in this country without white people, you're mad. You're absolutely crazy. They never penned not one word of that Constitution, not one word of those documents. There wasn't one black, one woman, one oriental, one queer that I know of. There may have been a whoremonger in there or two, but there wasn't any queers that penned any of those documents. The ones that they're using against you now were penned by old white men. And they're using them against you to exterminate you, to get rid of you, to put you down. How's that for an umbrella? I mean, the reason it was created was an umbrella for everyone. And now it's excluding us. Get out from under the umbrella. It's not about you, it's about us. No, no, it was originally about us. It just extended to them. I have no problem with that. You come to this country, you can live free, but you can't go around killing people because you believe in Allah. Right? But if you want to worship Allah, have at it. <clears throat> we haven't seen nothing yet. You wait. Time marches on. This thing's going to get more crazy by the minute. <clears throat> okay, I'm done. Anybody got a question or a comment? Well, he used fire to help destroy some of Job's stuff. The fire consumed the flocks. And I, I, just, I, I just drew a conclusion that and he's, he's considering Job the remnant here. And he's used the fire. He's not consuming him with water. Let's put it that way. He used fire. Yeah. yeah. but the remnant of them. A remnant means they remain, what remains of them.
Well, it could have a prophetical application because the Antichrist is able to call down fire from heaven. Okay? But so can Elijah. So, um, I think he's referring to him as being destroyed, that he, 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 he was consumed. And God used fire in that. Not just fire, but he used a lot of fire in that. Yeah, he's sitting on an ash heap, yeah. So I, I don't know, other than there's some type of future application to it, I don't have any uh, idea what that could mean. I mean, the fact that the, the, those that, are, that perished in the flood are in hell, uh, but he's talking about the remnant of them. Well, Job is, would, would be, I mean, the remnant of them is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So somewhere along the line, they're saying, you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there could be application to the tribulation, to the after the millennium. Yeah, I, I don't have any other way. I don't, I'm not sure what you're getting at as far as... I was wondering if there's somewhere between Genesis and Job, if there's fire that they could be referenced. Yeah. Yeah, a good point is that, yeah, like Paul said, he's, he is sitting on an ash heap, <laughs> you know, and he has seen God consume everything that he has. How does, how does he know that? How does he know that? From, from what does he, does he just make that up? Or is it, is fire the logical antithesis of water? No, I think, I think he's witnessed it, that God didn't use water to drown those sheep, he used fire. Yeah, yeah. He's saying he's the remnant of the wicked. Yeah, if you think that if you watch it, you can consume and set fire to stuff by fire. It probably has more prophetical applications, something in the future. A lot, a lot of what these guys are saying is right. It's just aimed at the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's about, about the Antichrist, too, and which is consumed by fire, by the way. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. That's second coming. All that, that, by the way, I told you that entire passage is second advent. The entire passage down through there will fit the second advent. So any, anytime you're reading about something where they're talking about the past, well, that which hath been shall be. That's what your Bible's teaching you. You're reading a picture of something else. So, and remember, a lot of what these guys say, except for the fact that he made all those accusations against Job that weren't true, but there, there are wicked that have done that. They have stolen a pledge or done this or that, and they're worthy of that. So that's, you know, but it, it's, it's just the point that they aimed it all at Job, and it wasn't so. That's the point. So I think what, what he's referring to there is that Job, uh, you, you've come through the flood, but you're still the wicked. And whereas he took care of them by water, and remember, he's still using the same terminology. He said, the waters covered you. The waters of God's wrath is, is what's covering you now. But God's decided to destroy you by fire. Tribulation-wise, it's true. When the Lord comes back, he destroys them with fire. It says the fire goeth before him. I mean, he's, it says behind him, or in front, in front, let's see, in front of him, the Garden of Eden, behind him, it's a wasteland or desolation. He's burning that thing up. He said, talks about their, their faces gathering blackness. He scorches them. It's going to be scorched earth policy all around the globe, man. Could be. Could be. That may be, yeah, the bow's in the sky, and that was the promise. So, yeah, I guess they figured, you know, Lord's going to, 
And it may be just because God didn't use all fire to consume Job. They're, they're making that assumption or they're making that accusation against him because God didn't use all fire against him. He used all kinds of, he used, the, he used the whirlwind. He used his enemies. But fire did fall from heaven, and that is a second advent phenomenon. Um, probably between Isaac and Jacob. Could have. Yep, possible. I have to look, see what might even be about the same time frame too. That would that would make sense too. Yeah, I don't know why, but I didn't think that Sodom and Gomorrah was in the same time frame, but it is because it because I think a. Uh, Dr. Ruckman placed him between somewhere between Isaac and Jacob or somewhere in Isaac's time that this happened. Um, well, you figure around 1800 for, well, that would be before, that would probably be before Job then. So maybe that is the historical. Yeah, recent memory. And maybe he's saying the remnant of the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed them with fire. But he's also aiming, he's got to be aiming it at Job too. Because that's who they're aiming all this stuff at. Yep. So he says, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed you, you're wicked. Hmm? Yep. God drowned out the, the, the wicked people were, and there's a remnant of wickedness, so now he burned it, and you're just doing the rest of it. It'd be like him saying, you aren't from Sodom, are you? <laughs> Horrible. 